I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hi folks, we're going to be changing the format of Bigfoot in History. It's going to be a different show. We're going to run these for the next couple of weeks and then we'll be making the change. But uh, for the time being, I hope you enjoy these eight stories out of the past. Welcome. These eight stories are a collection being brought to you by William Jevening and are being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story 1. Sasquatch Story. Sonoma County, California. Sonoma County, California. Just a story. Terrifying screams heard. No sighting. July 1980. Well, I have collected enough information from various Bigfoot sites about screams to conclude that I heard a Sasquatch on a bicycle touring trip from Portland, Oregon to Santa Barbara, California in the summer of 1980. My girlfriend and I arrived at Fort Ross Historical Park north of Jenner, California, in Sonoma County on an evening in mid-July. We decided to camp there at Fort Ross, as it was marked as a campsite on our map, but it had no campsites. There was no one at the main house nor around the fort, old Russian fur trading fort, or on any part of the grounds. We rode to a campground further south, but it was too expensive. We decided to ride back to Fort Ross. We camped to the left of the upper parking lot under some Monterey pines next to a picnic bench. We ate dinner and went to bed at around 9 p.m. At approximately 1 a.m., a scream 20 feet to the left of the tent our heads were facing the ocean, a blood-curdling scream of various sounds in succession that lasted at least nine seconds. It frightened me to my bone marrow. I froze in fear, knowing that whatever made the sound was huge. It was so close, I could hear the tremor in its throat. Since I'm a musician, I realize how much force it takes to make a sound that loud. I've also been camping all my life and have heard various animals, but this was different. I have been told it was a bear or a mountain lion, but I don't think so. Anyway, my girlfriend said in a whisper, What the frick was that? I started to reach for a flashlight, and her hand grabbed my wrist with a vice-like pressure so I didn't move. We remained frozen, listening to every little noise for an hour. Incidentally, there were sheep running free everywhere, going, ba ba, and they didn't stop making noise when the scream occurred. Finally, my girlfriend fell asleep, and I remained on guard with my hands hovering around the tent pole to use as a weapon, thinking that at any moment it would stick its fanged head into our tent. At around 2.30 a.m., I guess, I heard another scream down by the fort in the lower parking area. I figured it wasn't coming back, so I fell asleep. It didn't occur to me the next morning that it was a Sasquatch, so I didn't look for footprints, nor did I hear it walking the night before. This is the end of story one. Story number two. A story from Tehama County, California. Summer, 1977, 12 o'clock a.m. No sighting, just an odd occurrence. Nearest town, Chester, Highway 36 at Lost Creek Road, Willow Springs Campground in the Mount Lassen National Forest. Directions, take Highway 36 out of Red Bluff, then Wilson Lake Road to First Right. The road number is 29 North 18. It leads right into Willow Springs Campground, Lassen National Forest at 530-595-4444. My grandpa, my uncle, and I had been working in the area picking up sugar pine and digger pine cones for about three days or so, and had planned on being there for around a week. We were camped in a lower campsite in this campground, just off the main cinder road coming by the camping area. I remember the camp was right next to a creek, 
and each night we would hear the deer coming down to the creek to water, and would occasionally shine our flashlights and see them drinking. One particular night we were sitting around relaxing, and I commented that it was strange that we didn't hear any deer in the creek. In fact, I don't recall even hearing any crickets or any of the usual nighttime noises. There was a group of people camped above us about 100 yards or so up the hill, and they hadn't been there camping as long as we had. The three of us could hear the people in the camp talking and such. Then it was quiet. Suddenly someone in the upper camp shouted, Hey! Then some loud talking, and then this growl, scream noise. It was very loud and sounded as if it came from a fairly large animal. My uncle and I looked at each other, asking each other what the heck that noise was. And we looked at my grandpa, who was smiling and chuckling, which I found to be very odd unless it was to cover up being frightened himself. My grandpa was a retired logger from Oregon. My uncle had also spent considerable time in the woods, working as well as hunting most of his life. I had spent a lot of time in the woods, also hunting and working for my uncle, but had never heard a sound like that nor had the rest of us. My grandpa said he thought it was probably a bobcat or cougar, but my uncle and I had never heard any animal make that kind of sound, not to mention the fact that those animals will most likely stay away from a loud camp and may venture closer when it is dark and quiet. Anyway, while we were wondering what the first noise was, there began a lot of hollering and another loud growl scream from the upper camp. Vehicle doors slamming, and then the vehicle took off down the road, tires throwing cinders. They were out of there but fast. We, my uncle and I, were shaken up, but too proud to admit it to my grandpa. We didn't hear anything else from the upper camp. Nothing. I don't know if they left anything up there, but, or how they were camped or anything. I do know that they didn't come back. We went to bed as it was getting late and I was so afraid to make any sound, fearful that it would hear me breathing and come into camp to investigate. We left a couple of days later, but I don't recall hearing a deer in the creek in the evenings after that night. All of the information given here is to the best of my recollection. As for the terrain, it was heavily wooded pine forest, quite a bit of brush around the creek area. That's the end of story number two. Story number three. Weaverville, Trinity County, California. A young grocery clerk in Weaverville, Trinity County, took me to a point at which he came upon a light-colored Sasquatch during the winter of 1994. It was not far from Big Bar Ranger Station, where he and his girlfriend used to park and neck after work. Engaged in some heavy petting, they were interrupted by the rocking motion of his Chevy Camaro, they looked around, thinking it was one of their friends or other kids screwing around with them, but the windows were pretty fogged up. There was little visibility. Determined to confront the intruder, the young fellow bounced out of the Camaro, screaming, Knock it off! in a most assertive tone, only to find himself face to face in the pitch dark with a hulking figure he described as a bit taller than he was. Stunned, the kid backed up into the open car door, unable to move. He said the Bigfoot, with his left fist, wailed on the roof of his Camaro, beating it at least three times, but barely denting it. I heard it breathing. Man, I'm telling you, it was alive. Scary, blankety-blank. I heard it breathe. The informant called to his girlfriend inside the car, in what she later described as three octaves higher than his usual voice telling her to lay on the horn. Upon hearing the sound of the horn, the Sasquatch sidestepped, backing away from the car, and stared at the kid. I couldn't see his eyes or facial features, but it was clear he was facing me and looking at me. Even as dark as it was, he was only lit up by the car door light. The terrified kid said he got in the car, locked the doors, started the engine, and did a quick U-turn on Big Bar Dump Road. Amazingly, he said the Sasquatch followed them up the road where it turns onto Corral Bottom Road, keeping pace with the car for several hundred feet before trailing off 
where they could no longer see it. I spoke with the two informants at J.C. Cafe in Junction City for more than two hours. Their account never wavered, and they still showed great fear in recalling the event. The female witness never actually saw the creature, but said she heard its raspy breathing. It was evidently too dark to get much of a description other than what he could see of the creature, illuminated by the Camaro door's light. He knew right away what he was looking at, but in the shock of the moment he was able to distinguish little. Responding to my question, did you see a reflection from its eyes in the car light? He replied, there was no color or light emitted from its eyes. There was no smell from the creature, and he could not tell if it was male or female, only that it was this humongous dark towering image that he could hear breathing quite heavily and with angry intensity. He said it kept pace with his Camaro to about 20 miles an hour. Then it trailed off, but he wasn't sure of his speed. His girlfriend, amazed by it all, only saw a blurred image through the foggy windows. A happy ending to this story, though. The Amherst couple are now married and expecting twins. This is the ending of story number three. Story number four, Late at Night, Canada. In June 1996, chief editor of Animal Watch, Alex Michael, wrote of her encounter with Sasquatch in volume number one, issue number ten. I thought to copy the article here as I found it one of the more chilling accounts I have read, and educational as well. Late at Night by Alex Michael. A true story. My family has always been notorious for doing things at odd hours, and as you may well know, the strangest things always happen late at night. It was an unusually warm autumn some years ago, and at 16 years of age I had just finished a summer job as an arts and crafts camp counselor. The only thing left to do was pick up a rather large trunk filled with my belongings. Unable to fit such a large trunk inside the VW Beetle I had purchased just a few weeks before, my mother was volunteered to transport it from the mountains back to the city in the larger of the family cars. Summer camp was a very wild place for me, with staff partying every night until the wee hours of the morning. My room was near the entrance of the staff residence where all these parties took place. By late July, Sleep-deprived party wimps like myself were weeded out, so I built a single mattress-sized platform in the woods and then covered it with polyplastic. Bow Valley Provincial Park, an undisturbed protected forest, was only a stone's throw away. It is there that my mother, a small dog named Willow, and myself were going to retrieve my trunk at three o'clock on a Monday morning. Why three in the morning? Well, I could say it was the heat, but it was mostly because my father had not yet been told that the car would be leaving town. There was also my adolescent fear that knowledge of the platform construction would somehow reflect itself in a summer paycheck I had not yet received. My mother had to be at work by 6.30, so we had less than an hour to complete this covert action. As we approached the highway turnoff, a sliver of the moon cast a glowing border around southwestern Alberta's Mount Yamnuska. Driving several miles along the gravel road, the camp looked deserted. Summer staff had cleared out several weeks before, and a handful of permanent staff were either taking days off in the city or asleep in cabins several miles from the summer campsite. Angling off on the side of the road, my mother left the headlights on, pointing into the trees. There was some discussion about taking the 20-pound dog named Willow for protection. However, Willow's track record for wandering off severely threatened a successful completion of the mission. Plus, very uncharacteristically, the dog named Willow now refused to get out of the car and was partially hidden under the driver's seat. Car headlights were of no value after the first few seconds of meandering through the forest. We had a flashlight, but I was having difficulty remembering the exact location. 
The 15-minute walk turned into a 30-minute skin-scraping bushwhack, but finally we arrived at the isolated platform, even though the flashlight batteries were now dead. I assured my mother all that needed to be done was to take down the polyplastic rain cover and carry back a mattress and the trunk. It should only take two trips. She was noticeably silent as we began working in the darkness. My mother began untying strings, securing the poly to the ground, and I was kneeling on top of the four-foot-high platform, stretching up to reach some tangled binder twine knots tied to a tree. A pungent smell suddenly flooded the air. My eyes moved from the knots to the tall length of plastic. There, distorted through the semi-transparent poly, was a huge shadow only about seven feet away. With the four-foot platform and me kneeling on top, the creature was easily at eye level. A split second later, there was an incredibly loud, screaming roar. Although I know of nothing to describe it, the sound was like a peacock scream, a bear growl, and a lion's roar, all somehow combined. I can't tell you if I screamed. I can't tell you much of anything, other than my eyes continued to peer through the plastic at this massive shadow my five-foot-three-inch-tall mother had somehow leaped into the air and was now up on the platform beside me. Whatever it was finally turned and walked slowly away on its long behind feet. We continued watching as each heavy step could be heard contacting the ground. There were no visible ears, just a sparse mohawk-like fringe sprouting up from the tapering top of the creature's head. From behind... The upper body appeared massive. It continued to walk upright until disappearing into the trees. We stayed on top of the platform, motionless, for some time after. Then, finally, I started ripping down the plastic. I have no idea what my mother did during the next forty or fifty seconds, but my next memory was power walking through the forest, balancing a single mattress on top of my head with one hand and carrying the handle of the trunk in the other. I assumed my mother was holding up the other end of the trunk. With Willow still hidden under the driver's seat, it was a very quiet drive home. Late at night, they say that your mind can play tricks on you, but I am so certain. Brown bears had been in the area that summer, but I have never seen a bear walk upright that smoothly for that long a time. Or could it have been a very large, long-furred man standing over seven feet in height? I say man because intuition tells me that the creature was a male. Could it have been a Sasquatch that night? I will never really know for sure, but you can bet that I will keep telling the story, as if it were. This is the end of story number four. Story number five. Logan Lake... British Columbia, Canada. Nearest big city, Kamloop. The informants, a man and his wife, were not too far from me camping in the summer of 2000, and during their stay they were experiencing some rather frightful events. The reason they contacted me was because they had come across my sighting, and because theirs happened so close they wanted to talk to me. They were camping for two weeks, and during this time... Their food was being taken, and even some clothes were missing. They thought maybe coyotes, or even bears. But one morning, after hearing something in the campsite during the night, they woke up to find everything tossed around the campsite. Even the guy's boat on a trailer was moved a few feet. One night in particular, something hit the side window and broke it, and in the morning, they found a large rock sitting there in the dirt. On another night, they said it sounded like a few people were outside their camper mumbling. Jill said it was like someone had their mouth full of food. I pictured the Sasquatches eating all their food and trying to talk to each other. After that morning incident, they cleaned up and had breakfast, when Jill had noticed bare footprints just off to the side of their camper, and they said it was obvious to them by the size of the prints that the visitor during the night had to be a Sasquatch, nothing else. They said the prints were around 18 inches long. The man put his size 12 foot inside the print, and 
there were still five or so inches more in length. They told me that a couple days later they were out in the boat fishing and actually saw this thing in their campsite while they were out in the boat. Apparently it was throwing their stuff around and making a mess of things. The couple described the Sasquatch as a reddish brown with long arms and a funny shaped head. They believed it to be a male because of its bulk, size, and height, which they say was about seven to eight feet tall. I asked if it could have been a bear, and they both replied, As God is our witness, what we saw was a Sasquatch. After describing the arms, legs, head, and all, there was nothing else it could have been. Personally, judging by their body language and the way they were trembling while talking to me, I believe them 100%, no doubt whatsoever. The older couple said they waited in the boat for a while until they were certain it was gone, and as fast as they could they chucked everything in the camper and left the area, only packing up properly when they got to the town where they ended up staying that night. The couple were in their sixties, very clean and neat and polite. I can't see these two spinning a tail because it's been almost six years since that time, and they preferred not to be bothered by it. The sighting area is no more than a 40-minute car ride from me, and it's exciting because I've actually heard of another sighting in that area, but I didn't pay much attention to the person at the time, but now I'm going to try and track him down to hear what he has to say. I'm wondering if maybe there is a Sasquatch, and it could still be in that area. Tim Martindale, Merritt, British Columbia. This is the end of story number five. Story number six. Teapot Hill Hiking Trail in Cultus Lake Provincial Park. My name is Sanel Hodzik, and today, December 12th, 2012, at approximately 3 p.m., I was hiking with my dog up Teapot Hill Hiking Trail near Cultus Lake Provincial Park in the Fraser River Valley. The nearest town would be toward Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. On my way down the trail, I was changing my music on my iPhone, not really paying attention to my surroundings, when I noticed that my dog, Lila, was barking like crazy. She was about five feet ahead of me and staring off into the distance, so I stopped and looked ahead when I noticed something in the bushes about fifty feet ahead of me. I was so scared that I froze and just kept staring at it. After about a ten-second stare-down, I switched my camera on and quickly took a picture. Meanwhile, my dog is still barking like crazy. I then picked up a rock and threw it in the direction of the thing, and then I quickly turned around and ran back up the hill. I waited about until I saw someone else coming down the hill, and I followed him closely behind all the way down. So I do believe I saw the Sasquatch or Bigfoot that day. If I could describe it, I would say he was about eight to nine feet tall, very hairy and big. His skin color was brownish. His face was something like a monkey or ape. I took it with a full zoom on my iPhone 4. He was about 50 yards away from me. He's in the middle rightish of the picture. Only thing I noticed really was how he was standing, looking at me. It had a long face, but bigger forehead with long hair starting from about the top of its head. Sonel Hodzik, Chilliwack, British Columbia. That is the end of story number six. Story number seven. Letter from El Paso County, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Summer, 1991. To whom it may concern. After reading some of your stories regarding Bigfoot, I thought I would add something I have kept rather a secret for quite some years. I was a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado, back in the summer of 1991. I had been at the academy for only a few weeks and was finishing up basic training when it happened. Now, the academy itself sits on the foothills of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Basically, I could step out of the cadet area and I would be standing in the mountains. There's plenty of brush, trees, and so on to conceal just about anyone of anything you want back there. 
Anyhow, one night, about 9 p.m., my roommate and I were laying in bed chatting about our upcoming camp out in Jack's Valley, an area just beside the academy where we did a lot of field training, when we heard what sounded like a woman screaming her head off. It was absolutely horrific to hear. What was most interesting was that prior to the blood-curdling noise, we could hear the other cadets in their rooms talking and joking. The campus was basically shut down for the night, and everyone was getting ready for the next day. I remember the ambient noise being rather loud. Then this scream came. All of a sudden you could have heard a pin drop, it was so quiet. I turned and asked my roommate if he heard what I and everyone else had just heard. I know, what a dumb question. He looks at me and says, Oh yeah, that's the local Bigfoot. I couldn't believe it, but of course, I heard it. He then proceeds to tell me about a buddy of his who saw a big hairy human drinking at a local lake. When it saw his friend watching it, it stood up, turned away, and walked into the forest. Of course, the next week in Jack's Valley, for me, was a very nervous affair. I was more worried about getting up at night and walking to the latrine by myself than I was running the assault course. Well, I just thought I'd add my two cents worth. Please withhold printing my name from this email if you decide to post it. Thank you. That's the end of story number seven. Story number eight. Lake Christie, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. My story. I don't even know where to begin. To this day, even the thought of what I am about to tell you makes every hair on my body stand up and brings tears to my eyes. Why the tears? I don't know. But they are genuine. I have never discussed this with anyone, and hadn't planned to, but after stumbling across your site, I think I've had a change of heart. I live in Ontario, Canada. It is probably for this reason that I have never said anything until now. To my knowledge, almost all Sasquatch sightings are along the west coast on the continent and along the Rocky Mountains. I don't know how many sightings have been recorded this far east, but I know what I saw and heard on a few separate occasions. I used to work at a scout camp in northeastern Ontario. It is in a very remote location, nearly an hour's drive from any civilization, and one of the only true scout camps in all of Canada. It is surrounded by lakes and large hills of dense forests on all sides, and there are a few cottages scattered here and there around the main lake and camp that it's stationed on. Lake Christie, if I remember correctly. Although I live far away from this place, I worked there every summer from 1996 to 1999. My first experience happened in 1996. I was 16 years old. As a counselor, every two weeks we were moved around and put in charge of different scout and cub scout groups. I guess so everyone gets a chance to work with groups of all ages. On this particular rotation, I was working with one of the senior scout groups at the camp. As part of their last week there, they had to partake in what was called a solo night. This is where each camper is driven by one of the assistant camp directors to a remote location and left for the night with the bare necessities to survive, a sleeping bag, rations for one day, and two strike-anywhere matches. It was on this particular night that I will never forget the sounds that I heard. It was late at night in August, I'm not exactly certain of the time, and I was sleeping in my tent in the upper field, which is not exactly on the upper campgrounds, but up the dirt road quite a ways and into the bush another five minutes walk. Altogether, probably a twenty-minute walk from the main campground. In the middle of my slumber I was suddenly awakened by a loud deep shrieking, squealing sound that I had never heard before. I sat up in my tent, alarmed and uncertain of what I had heard. 
I thought maybe it was one of my colleagues playing a trick on me, and the other two counselors who were camped up there alone for the night, or one of the other two for that matter. This being a camp full of staff who are well known for their pranks, I wouldn't have put it past them. Then I heard the noise again. It was even louder. At first I thought it was a skunk being attacked by coyotes or something. I have heard that sound before and witnessed it. For those who don't know, skunks actually make a sort of shrieking, squealing sound when being mauled to death. I saw it firsthand, but that is another story altogether. Editor's Note All mustelidae, such as wolverines, weasels, badgers, civet cats, skunks, and otters, etc., emit a loud to groaning squeal or high-rolling shriek, often sounding like a woman in hopeless distress when caught by predators or in iron-set traps. The sound can be very loud and unnerving, even from a wounded rabbit. However, the sound was much deeper then, just as it had come, the sound stopped. I lay awake for the rest of the night, barely moving a muscle. When morning came, and the sun was bright enough, I slowly came out of my tent and walked to the main campground for breakfast. A few minutes later, the other two counselors came down to the main camp and gave me a mysterious glance. Then one of them approached and asked me, was that you making all that racket last night? You scared poor Dave half to death. I just looked at him and said, What racket? With a stone-cold look. He gave me a knowing look and walked away. We never discussed it after that, and no one mentioned pulling a prank on me or the other two that night. Sooner or later, everyone owned up to their pranks, but no one even mentioned this one at all. It was not until months later that I realized what I may have heard. I was watching a documentary on TV about Bigfoot, and a crew hunting the evasive being had recorded what they thought were mating calls of the mysterious creature. When I heard the sounds of the recording come from the TV, the memories of that night came back to me. I quickly sat up, eyes glued to the screen, and the hairs on my neck stood up again. It sounded almost identical. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Again. My next encounter was two years later. 1998, in August, again. It was late August, and there were no more cubs for the remainder of the summer, so the designated cub field and its cabins were vacant. So, not having much to do and no kids to watch, I decided to sleep in the cub field with the rest of the staff who had no children to take care of. The cub field is exactly that. It is a large clearing in the middle of a dense forest, up yet another hill. It is probably 150 yards wide and probably 200 to 250 yards long, with a row of small cabins on either side. While I laid in bed in one of the cabins, I woke a little after 12 o'clock a.m. I don't know why, but I was just suddenly awake. In the distance, I heard what I thought was howling, but I wasn't exactly sure. It sounded kind of muffled, but I was used to that sort of thing. I looked over at one of the other counselors staying in my cabin that night, and he was fast asleep. Then, out of nowhere, I heard what I thought was someone running right by my cabin. The steps were heavy and quick. I shot out of bed, grabbing my flashlight, wondering who was running around at this hour, since everyone was supposed to be in bed hours ago. I swung the door of the cabin open and shone my flashlight in the field. I couldn't believe what I saw next. About forty feet away, diagonally from me, I saw a large, hairy creature walking across the field very swiftly. I stood there in shock wondering what my eyes were seeing. This thing was absolutely enormous. At first I thought it might be a bear, but then realized something. It was walking upright, on two legs. It was very tall, bulky, and had dark brown hair covering its entire body. Then, as if noticing my flashlight, it stopped, turned, and looked at me. 
I could see the yellow reflection of its eyes and its face. The face seemed to be almost half human, half ape-like, having little hair on its face, but the skin was almost the same color as its hair, a sort of light brownish color. It stood there, looking at me, and I at it, for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably more like a few seconds. I wanted to scream. I wanted to wake up the others, but I was frozen. I was caught up in the phenomenon that I was seeing and couldn't move. That's when I noticed the smell. It was such a rancid odor I had to plug my nose to save from puking. Then the creature turned and began to continue its swift movement across the field, and in a matter of seconds it was across the field, walked between two cabins and into the dense forest. It was when it walked between the two cabins that I realized how tall this being was. I am six foot tall, without standing on my tiptoes. I can reach approximately to the seven foot four inch mark. This thing, as it walked between the two cabins, was taller than where the top one of the doors is. The cabins are elevated off the ground. From standing on the ground, I cannot touch the top of one of the doors. I am a couple of inches shy of it. I checked the next day. I would estimate that this thing was probably around eight feet tall, or close to it. Again, I lay awake for the remainder of the night, my hatchet by my side. This was the scenario for many of the remaining nights of that summer before I went home. There were even sleepless nights afterwards while at home. I didn't think I was afraid of anything until that night. I tried searching for tracks the next day, but to no avail. I couldn't find anything. The next day I asked one of the head counselors if there were any large animals in the general area, such as bears, and he said, no, apparently there were no bears for miles and miles. I never mentioned anything about what I saw that night. I didn't want anyone to think that I was crazy. I thought I would just wait and see if anyone else mentioned something before I said anything. No one did. My last encounter was the following and my final year, yet again in August. I don't know why I went back after all of the nightmares and sleepless nights from the previous summer. I guess I thought it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. This time, I had taken a rowboat out onto the lake with a lady friend whom I had met that summer. Yes, there are female staff at scout camps. The main beach for the camp is in a small inlet of the lake, almost like a sort of small bay, before it opens up. As I was taking her on our romantic moonlight row, as I was taking her out on a romantic moonlight row, I heard what I thought was somebody whistling at me. I stopped rowing. She didn't hear it, but I know I did. I looked around at the surrounding shoreline and didn't see anything. Next, I heard a splash a little one, as if someone had thrown a rock into the water. I thought maybe another couple was somewhere along that shore. I grabbed my flashlight. She grabbed hers. We scanned the shore from the safety of our boat to see if we could spot them. We were scanning in different sections. Then I saw them, those eyes, the yellow reflection. I focused in on them, and they had an eerie resemblance to the ones I had seen the year before. Do you see them? I heard her ask. Without looking away, I said, No. You? No, she replied. What is that? Referring to the eyes caught in my light. A deer? she asked. Yeah, probably, I said. But I knew better. Then the eyes were gone. We then agreed that there was probably another couple out there, and we didn't want to get busy in front of other people. So I turned the boat around, and we went back to the camp. I have kept these secrets with me for five-plus years now. This is one thing I can honestly say I haven't told a single soul until now. 
I will never forget what I've seen and heard. Although there was no physical contact, I have been extremely traumatized from what I've experienced. All this has been put in the back of my mind until now, probably because there was a show on this Discovery Channel about Sasquatch today. Like I said before, it still makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. This is the end of the eight stories. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.